the director of the Center for Jewish Studies, also faculty member in German. And I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce, and uh, it's really an honor to have Susan Faludi with us today. Before I begin, I want to thank the following departments and centers, the Center for Austrian Studies, the Center for German and European Studies, the Creative Writing Program, and the Edelstein Keller Endowment, the Department of English, the Department of German, Scandinavian, and Dutch, and the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Um, and um, also am thrilled that so many of you, both students and community members, are here with us today. So the format today, Susan Faludi will be reading um, from um, In the Dark Room, from her memoir for about 20 to 25 minutes. And this will be followed then by a conversation with Professor Elaine Tyler May, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions um, from all of you. Um, so Susan Faludi is a Pulitzer Prize winning nonfiction author, a former reporter for the Wall Street Journal, who has published extensively in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the Nation, and Harper's, among many other venues, and is also a best-selling author. She is the author of Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women, which won the National Book, Cir Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction, and also of Stift, The Betrayal of the American Man, and The Terror Dream, Myth and Misogyny in an Insecure America. Her most recent book, In the Dark Room, is a fascinating memoir, as those of you who haven't yet had a chance to encounter it will see, that weaves together the story of her father, Holocaust family history, transgender identity, and the history of Hungary. It is really a remarkable piece of work. Um, so as I mentioned, Susan Faludi will be joined later in today's program in conversation with Regents Professor Elaine Tyler May, Chair of the History Department at the U. Uh, Professor May is a scholar of 20th century U.S. history, women's history, social history, with a focus on the intersections of gender, sexuality, and politics. She is the author of too many books for me to fully recite here, but let me just mention um, several of the most recent ones, Homeward Bound, American Families in the Cold War Era, and America and the Pill, A History of Promise, Peril, and Liberation. And her newest book that recently appeared, Fortress America, How We Embraced Fear and Abandoned Democracy. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation between Susan uh, Faludi and Elaine Tyler May. And again, my pleasure to be able to welcome Susan Faludi to campus. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? I, I don't think there's, I think this mic is dead, so. Wave at me if you <laughs> if I am if I'm fading. Okay. Um, and Leslie, thank you so much, and and thank you to all those many departments who were involved in bringing me here. And I'm really thrilled to be in conversation with my old wonderful friend Elaine Tyler May, um, whose work has inspired me for so many years. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes, and then we're going to jump to conversation. I'm going to read you a few excerpts as well. Um, I, I thought I'd start out where this story starts out, with an email I received from my father 14 years ago. Uh, the subject line of this email was, changes. And it, it began, Dear Susan, I've got some interesting news for you. I've decided that I've had enough of impersonating a macho, aggressive man that I've never been inside. Well, the interesting news, which was illustrated with several attached selfies, uh, was that my father, without telling anyone in the family, had flown to Thailand to have gender reassignment surgery. Steve Faludi was now Stephanie. Naturally, this surprised me. Um, also, understand my father at the time was 76 years old. Uh, and also, we had been estranged. We had barely spoken to each other in nearly a quarter century. Uh, this is because my father was indeed a macho, aggressive man uh, when I was growing up. Also autocratic, bullying, and even physically violent. Um, all of which fueled my early feminism. 
Uh, now, some of you know my previous work, and you know that I write about political and public issues, personal stuff, not so much. Uh, so this was a big departure for me and a bit unnerving, but it was also what my father wanted. In the phone call that followed the email, my father said, write my story, which was the beginning of this project. And so a couple of months after the email, I jumped on a plane to Hungary, which is where my father was living. Uh, in 1990, my father had returned to the country where she had grown up. And by the way, if you're wondering why I'm saying my father instead of, say, my parent, uh, that's uh, because that's what my father wanted. I'm still your father, she liked to say to me. So on this first visit and subsequent ones, we pursued the process of getting to know each other again. For me, probably the least difficult part was coming to accept my father as a woman. Far harder was dealing with all the ghosts that haunted both of us from our past. Um, and clearly my father's identity quest, which had culminated in her surgery, was bound up with many other aspects of her past and her long life. Um, so apropos of that, I want to read first an excerpt that suggests how her life as a woman was entwined with her life as a father, and so with mine as a daughter. This one's sort of my long, the longest of the three excerpts. The others are much shorter, <coughs> just so you know. <laughs> um. My father broke into a run pounding across the plaza to the entrance of a 10-story commercial building a few blocks from the Danube, skirt rustling, black pumps clacking on the concrete. She jammed a leg in the glass door just as it was closing behind a mail carrier. We had arrived at her doctor's office. They locked the entrance, she called over her shoulder. Come on. We took the elevator to an upper floor in a waiting area at the end of a long, tatty corridor, two sagging vinyl couches were pushed up against opposing walls. The scruffy carpet was balding and matched the mud color of the couches. A line of baby photos was thumbtacked to one wall. Don't you want one of these? My father was pointing at the baby pictures. I pretended not to hear and studied the large plaque to the right of them. Dr. Andre Beasley, it read obstetrics and gynecology. The inner door swung open before she could ask me again. A very tan and silver-haired gent in an Izod shirt and Dr. Smock greeted us. Kezej, Choklum, he said. Um, this is the old-fashioned Hungarian uh, greeting from a man to a woman. It means literally, I kiss your hand. And then, turning to my father, Kezej, Choklum. My father grinned and gave me a nudge. We followed the gynecologist into his consulting room, a small space with a cluttered desk and a credenza lined with sports trophies. My father settled her pocketbook on her lap and began chatting away in Hungarian. The bronze Dr. Mishli, who spoke no English, beamed and nodded affably. After a while, he made some notes on a prescription pad, tore out the sheet, and handed it to my father. A refill for her estrogen. My father deposited the slip in her purse. I was just telling Dr. Measley, my father said, turning to me, that I am the quote-unquote mother of you. She made air quotes with her fingers. Who, she added, is not a mother. Who, I said. You. Not yet, anyway. How did he get these trophies, I asked. I was changing the subject. Oh, Dr. Measley is a great yachtsman, my father explained. He has a 20-foot boat, and he's won many prizes. She translated her flattery to Captain Measley, who beamed some more. They carried on for a while, my father pointing a finger at me from time to time. I'm telling him about your problem, she said. Problem? There may be physical reasons. There are no... Dr. Measley put away his prescription pad. I pulled out my reporter's notebook. Can I ask a few questions, I, I said. Dr. Measley indicated through my father that he was amenable. <clears throat> Do you see a difference since the operation? 
The doctor dawdled with his answer. He says, my face is very nice now, my father translated. He says, I have very few wrinkles for a man my age. What I meant, I said, was does Dr. Mutually see a difference in your personality? The reply was longer in coming. Dr. Mutually says that I'm a happy man, my father related. A happy person, she corrected herself. Dr. Mutually says this is very important because we don't know how many years a life brings, but at least a person must live it in happiness. Dr. Mutually, I thought, dispenses platitudes as well as pharmaceuticals. Dr. Measley wants to know how old you are, my father said. Forty-nine, I said, and thought peevishly. Don't you know? Dr. Measley said that he once had a patient who had her first baby past 48, so this is your last chance. <laughs> Dr. Measley wants to know if you've tried fertility treatments. I don't. Dr. Measley says you should monitor your ovulation. The gynecologist reached into a drawer and pulled out a small plastic device shaped like a kazoo. You spit into it, my father translated, and it tells you on the days you're impregnable. <laughs> impregnable? Whether you can have a baby. My, fa my father elbowed me. Okay, dear, he says now we can do the exam. No thanks, I said. But he's got free time and don't want an exam. The doctor reached into his desk and handed me a flyer, an advertisement for Mini Microsoft, the ovulation monitor. On the front, in girlish pink script and in English, it said, maybe baby. <laughs> it will only take 10 minutes, my father said. No. My father snatched up her purse and headed for the door, her face contracting into a familiar, a familiar scowl. We rode the elevator in silence. Downstairs, we stopped at the pharmacy. She had to pick up her hormones and found, out, found our place at the end of a long queue. I could feel my father appraising <clears throat> me. This business of no children, she said, it's not normal. When the prescription was finally ready, my father snatched it from the counter and flung herself through the door. I had to hurry not to lose her as she clapped furiously down a warren of back streets her white pocketbook swinging like a mainsail from the gaff of a bunched shoulder. At one point, she disappeared <coughs> around a corner, and I was overcome with the childlike terror of being lost. I caught sight of the flapping purse again as we reached Mascatere, the city's huge transport junction, still bearing then its communist era name. I followed at my father's heels as she crossed several sets of railroad tracks and came to rest on the platform for the number 59 tram. Some minutes into our wait, my father broke the silence. Everything reproduces, she said. Birds, bees, even these little weeds in the ground. She gestured toward a tuft of crab grass pushing through a, through a crack in the pavement. Without children, your existence has no meaning, my father said. And when I didn't answer, your books will stop selling. People will forget all about what you wrote. I looked down the tracks, willing the tram to come. It's the most important thing, she said. I turned to face her. Family, she finished. If family meant so much, I thought, and didn't say, why had she cut herself off from the one she was born into and the one she had sired? Wasn't she still cutting herself off from her whole fraught history as a troubled son and embattled husband and father? But what if something else was going on? My daughter likes me now, my father had told her new trans friends at the party she hosted in my honor. She comes to see me. I thought of the description she offered of, her, of herself in Mashok magazine. Stephanie, a child on Appa. Stephanie, the father of the family. An ear-piercing screech of metal wheels announced the approach of the tram. My father fixed a sharp eye on me. You are ending the family, she said. When a family gets discontinued, it's suicide for all these people who lived, all these people who came before you. She wasn't wrong, I thought. I had denied her family, not just by failing to have children, but by letting our estrangement drag on for so many years. It was the latter that caused me shame. 
So, um, to come to grips with my father's story, I had to confront a whole series of questions about identity. And ultimately, I had to ask myself, what is identity anyway? Is identity what you choose to be? Or is it the very thing you can't escape? My father, for her part, grew up Jewish, um, then named Ishtvad Friedman, an only child of wealthy parents in Budapest, uh, and lived a life of privilege until World War II when large numbers of our family would perish in the Holocaust. Uh, my teenage father survived by his wits on the streets of Budapest, passing as Christian with only um, a set of false identity papers and a stolen fascist armband. One time he would use that armband to impersonate a Hungarian Nazi Aerocross officer so as to rescue his parents from a prote so-called protected house whose residents um, were about to be dragged down to the Danube and shot into the river. Um, this was a fate, by the way, for thousands of uh, Budapest Jews in the winter of 1944. Um, after the war, my father would go on to other identity reinventions, <coughs> documentary filmmaker um, in the Brazilian outback, all-American commuter dad in Westchester County, muscular alpine mountaineer and rock climber, um, and high-end commercial photographer in Manhattan whose specialty was altering images. And when my father returned to Hungary after the fall of communism, another remake as a, quote, 100% Hungarian patriot, a diehard supporter of the current right-wing regime. I, I came to think of my father as a kind of identity zealot, channeling the last century's biggest marquee struggles over identity. People often see identity as singular and stable, um, but what I saw with my father was an identity that was multiple and fluid and had many threads which were often tangled in her mind. Um, so the, the second excerpt I want to read to you explores the conjunction of two uh, of those primary threads, gender and religion. <coughs> Bless you. Sorry. <laughs> I love this place, my father declared. It's authentic Hungarian. We were waiting for a table at the Fish Farm Inn, a restaurant decorated with dust-laden fishnets, buoys, and an entire dinghy hanging from the ceiling. My father liked to order their halisle, uh, a traditional spicy fish soup larded with enough paprika to burn out your brain on the first sip. My father especially loved the old-school waiters, elderly gents with formal manners, greeting her with courtly gallantry and pulling out her chair, addressing her with that vintage salutation of men to women, kese choklum. When the waiter left the table, I remarked on his deference. Well, my father said, they have to kiss my hand now. Why? Because, she said, I'm tough. I decided to exercise some toughness of my own. I announced I was foregoing the fish soup. It's made the correct way here, my father insisted, and proceeded to wear me down with one of her characteristic free-floating filibusters. Hallisley should only be made with river fish, or lake fish, but never salt water. It can be carp, perch, catfish. Now, Lake Balachon is the largest freshwater lake in, I said, I'd tried the soup. The waiter arrived with a cast iron kettle and began ladling out its contents, starting with my father's bowl. Ladies first, my father quipped. She looked pleased, a trickster, mocking and simultaneously enforcing convention. Lake Balaton, she said after a while. That's how we ended up hearing it on the radio. A conversation with my father was like a ride in a run amok submersible. One minute you were bobbing on the surface, the next trawling the ocean floor. Now she was back in the summer of 1944 when my fugitive father and grandfather hid in a Christian doctor's apartment while the doctor holidayed at Lake Balaton. Father and son had listened 
very quietly to the BBC. That's how we heard the Germans had taken away the Jews of Kasha, my father said now. She was referring to my grandfather's hometown. My father started to cry, my father said. He told me, they have killed my parents. Did he try to get his parents out, I asked. My father studied the tablecloth and said nothing. You did something, I said. You saved your parents. I was referring to the time my father rescued her parents by posing as a fascist aerocross officer. That was different, my father said. I believed it, so they believed it. I took part in their game. If you believe whoever you pretend to be, you're halfway saved. But if you act funny, if you act afraid, you're halfway to the gas chamber. My father ordered an authentic Hungarian dessert, a mountain of pureed chestnuts smothered in whipped cream served in a giant goblet. This role playing during the war, she said as she tackled the towering confection, that was a similar process. Similar to what, I said. I can sit down with anyone now, and he kisses my hand, she said. It strengthened me for life that I did these things back then, and that I could get away with it. So now I can do this other thing, meaning her change in sex. Because if you are convinced you are this other person, everybody else will be convinced. So what you're doing now, I ask, is that playing another role, too? I was role-playing as a man, she said, but I wasn't totally accepted. Now, as a woman, I'm not role-playing anymore. Because this is who you were all along, I asked. Well, it's who I am now, she said. Since the operation, I have developed another personality. Which has been easier for you, I asked. To be accepted as a woman after being born a man, or to be accepted as a Hungarian after being born a Jew? My father thought about it, holding her spoon before her like a hand mirror. As a woman, she said finally, because I am a woman with a birth certificate that says I'm a woman, so I must be a woman. My father polished off her dessert. So, she said, is the Inquisition over now? The lives and crimes of Stephanie Faludi? Oh, my God. We, filled out, we filed out into the night air. The Danube lay before us, obsidian and darkness. My father tugged at my sleeve. Getting away with it, she said. Susan, don't forget that line. That's the key to it all. Because a lot of people got discovered that they were Jewish, and they were shocked. So my father obviously conflated in her mind her different struggles with identity. But those struggles weren't just in the past, and they weren't just personal. Uh, in the time I was visiting my father, Hungary was going through its own identity crisis, one that has led it to the brink of a neo-fascist state. Um, I first encountered that crisis in downtown Budapest in 2008 when I was nearly mowed down by a street militia of men in black uniforms adorned with four red on white stripes. Uh, this was the paramilitary wing of the new, then new, far-right Yobik party, a party that was then openly advocating throwing Jews out of the country and rounding up Roma in detention camps. Um, that militia and others like it went on to terrorize Roma communities, beat up Jewish worshipers, and desecrate Holocaust memorials. Uh, there, that four-stripe insignia, by the way, is a near replica of the 1940s insignia of the Hungarian Nazi era cross. <coughs> well, in 2010, the rightist Fidesz party uh, championed a concocted uh, Magyar identity of martyred and chest-beating nationalism, um, a kind of make Hungary great again campaign. Uh, and they swept into power. The new government quickly pushed through a battery of laws undermining the independence of the court, the central bank, the media, a host of government oversight bodies. And they rewrote the Constitution, curtailing civil liberties, banning same-sex marriage, and declaring Hungary a Christian nation. And, oh yeah, uh, the Prime Minister, 
uh, Viktor Orban built a wall all along Hungary's southern border, a 13-foot high razor wire fence uh, to keep out refugees. The day after our elections, Orban was the first head of state to hail Trump's victory, declaring it on Facebook, great news. Part of what my book explores is the Janus-faced nature of identity. The way identity can either be liberating, as with LGBT rights, civil rights, or feminism, or it can be nationalistic and xenophobic. The first identity search seeks self-awareness and understanding. The second is an attempt to paper over painful realities and problems by retreating into a fantasy identity uh, based on scapegoating, self-pity, and the embrace of an authoritarian strongman, uh, all of which no doubt sounds kind of familiar. Um, and with that in mind, I thought I'd close with an excerpt from the book that shows these two forms of identity literally colliding. Are you going to be in the parade, I asked. We were washing dishes in my father's kitchen. My father took her time drying her aprons on her frilled yellow apron. I'm sorry, drying her hands on her frilled yellow apron. No. Why not, I asked. We were talking about the one annual public showing of Hungary's LGBT population, the Budapest Gay Dignity Procession. The parade was scheduled for July 5th, a few weeks hence. I did it once, my father said. So? So I don't need to do it again. It's boring. I didn't buy that. The grand dame of the gay parade, she'd exulted of herself after the 2006 march. She sent me pictures she'd taken with young revelers, and she couldn't stop talking about it. It's the signature event of the LGBT community, I said. Don't you want to be there? She gave her signature wave of dismissal. It's an irritant. Some of the transes don't dress tastefully, you know? <coughs> I didn't know. But I knew enough about the parade's reception to be secretly relieved she was planning on missing it. My father stacked the plates in the cupboard. She wiped down the counter slowly and took her time folding the matching yellow floral dish towels. Then she met my eye. There could be trouble, she said. The previous year, right-wing thugs had attacked the paraders as they marched down Andrashi Boulevard and beat up revelers too, so severely that they had to be hospitalized. The police were conspicuously absent. When a parade member called the police, she was told that having chosen to participate in the march, she, quote, should take its consequences. In the weeks leading up to the procession this year, the signs were even more ominous. The Hungarian right-wing militia and blogosphere were roiling with fury. The communique issued by the rightist Hunia organization was typical. We will not permit aberrant foreigners of this or that color to force their alien and sick world on Hungary. We hereby publicly declare that we ourselves will defend the Hungarian capital. Jobbik parliamentary members attempted to ban the parade and later introduced legislation to make the, quote, promotion of sexual deviations, including, quote, homosexuality, transsexuality, transvestism, and bisexuality, unquote, punishable by up to eight years in prison. In June, the far-right website Puruk posted the names and addresses of LGBT gathering spots in Budapest. A few days later, a gay bar and bathhouse, both on the website's list, were firebombed. The so-called Hungarian self-defense movement announced its intent to attack the parade and appealed to, quote, all Hungarians to expel the pederast, pederast horde once and for all. A soccer fan club promised to meet the marchers, quote, with weapons if we must, with bare hands if we must, but we will not let things stand as they are. In the keynote speech before the parade, former equality minister Kevin Levoyi talked about the rights and desires of LGBT people to build a community by making their identity public. Quote, a community, she said, may only find dignity if it becomes visible. <coughs> 
but the threats convinced many, like my father, to stay hidden. The day of the parade, bands of self-styled Hungarian patriots <coughs> broke through the police barricades and hurled smoke bombs, firecrackers, rocks, acid-filled eggs, rotting food, and excrement. They accosted parade, go parade goers, beat up a well-known liberal radio reporter, and attacked a Roma performer so viciously that the march's concert had to be canceled. They slapped and spat at a socialist politician who was on record as supporting the march and smashed the windows of the car carrying the former equality minister and the first openly gay government official. Marchers fled through an underground tunnel to the nearest subway station. In the course of the march, the predictable epithets were hurled. Dirty fags, perverts, rotten hell, and so on. One particular chant, though, seemed to capture the crowd's fancy. It was heard all along the parade road. Buza cat aduna bo, zero cat meg utano, which means queers into the Danube, followed by the Jews. Well, on that cheerful note, <laughs> um, I'm going to stop, and I think we're going to gab at you, and hopefully you'll gab at us. Thank you. about and I'll, I'll toss out a couple of things asking you to elaborate and I hope I won't have a coughing fit for me folks for reading my cold to the event. <laughs> but one of the amazing things about your book which has many amazing layers and, and pieces to it is the way that you weave together the issues of personal life, personal identity of your father, your family, yourself, and the larger world in which in which she lived and and is living at the end of her life as a woman and as a Hungarian. And starting with the last very poignant and also very distressing and disturbing quote uh, about the march, the, the fact that your, your father has embraced her identity as a woman proudly and as she described it comfortably, that this was really who she was and it wasn't a problem for her. It's interesting because in the course of her life, all the different ways in which she, as a man, tried to enact, embrace various identities with difficulty, she ends up as a Hungarian self-identified woman, and she's still a Jew. And um, what's so creepy about what happened in that in that parade is that <coughs> those who were hostile to the paraders are basically Nazis. You know, they bring to their uh, to to their rage against the LGBT community. You know, their hostility to the Romi, to gays and lesbians, to uh, trans people and, and Jews. And your father has embraced an identity as a trans woman that puts him, once again, you know, as a target of the same people who went after him as a, as a Jew during the, during the years of the Holocaust. And I just wonder if you can sort of 
<laughs> well, not everybody. Mean, if you could just kind of, very complex. you could kind of run with it and run with it in a way that might help us think about the contemporary world we're living in right now, uh, because I think a lot of us here are struggling with that and and with the issues of, of identity that are floating around, and that it really, you know, in this country certainly. The Trump era has opened up the floodgates here of all kinds of, um, you know, long-held hostilities and hatreds, and it's happening all over all over Europe. And your father's story really sort of encapsulates so much of this in a in a very interesting way. And um, I, I just wondered if you wanted to kind of expand on that issue a little. Yeah. Well, my. <laughs> I mean, my, everything with my father is doubled, you know, you can, and it's, um, it, it's a researcher and a journalist's either dream or nightmare, because right? you think you have it nailed down, and it's like, well, but it could be the opposite. I mean, the, the very question of why would my father return to Hungary, yeah. you know, the place where he was hunted as a teenager, where so many of our family members died, um, or were murdered. Um, with the avid complicity of Christian Hungarians. Um, and, you know, my father, I mean, my, my father said to me, well, this is where, this is where, this is what I call, this is home for me. Um, it reminded me of Patricia Pample's um, wonderful romantic education where she said, uh, where there's a, a, a Jewish fraternity to uh, what was then Czechoslovakia, and, and the same question was posed to her, and, and she said, well, you have to have your own country, even if it's Kafka land. <laughs> I think that was true for my father. It was, you know, okay, for all of this misery, this is, you know, the misery I, the misery I know is better than the misery that feels alien. So, so at the same time, I mean, in this whole question of identity, do you choose it, or is it what you can't escape? And, I mean, one of those chicken or egg questions where the answer, of course, is both. Um, and for my father, there was the identity um, that she chose, um, you know, choosing the terms and what, you know, when she was going to become a woman and how and how she was going to define that. Um, but there was also this inescapability part, and I think that brought her. Um, you know, at the same time, I think it was really complicated with my father because, I mean, first of all, she could have gone, she spent all this time in Brazil, which is a much more, you know, a much more comfortable place, whether it's, you know, race, religion, or, or gender. Um, and she came close to moving there, but then decided, you know, she, was gonna, she had to go back to Hungary. Um, and so on the one hand, she was sort of displaying this, um, it's sort of publicly displaying her devotion to Hungary and voting for the right wing party. Even before Fidesz, she joined the Small Landholders Party, which was a, a, another far right party, um, because they were claiming they were going to get people's property back. My father really wanted to reclaim property. But one of the first things she did after she moved to Hungary was put up this huge, like 25 foot flagpole. Um, so she could display the Hungarian flag on every major and minor holiday. Uh, so there was that side. But then on the other side, she, um, you know, particularly after she became a woman, she, she was sort of, you know, all right, uh, you know, accept me, accept me, for, you know, or don't accept me. I'm going to sort of put this in your face. And so, I mean, when I came to see her, which was only, you know, like two or three months after she had had the surgery, she had already gotten rid of the, she had been wearing wigs, and she just got rid of it, and she had sort of, you know, male pattern involvedness in it. And so she, we would walk around and she uh, attract looks, and she would just kind of brazen it out. And, um, and I, so I think part of, the, another part, so I guess my question here, which I can't answer, is did she come back? to Hungary to finally be accepted. Um, and she sometimes talked about, well, I'm more accepted as a woman now that I'm a woman. So is that it? Or did she come back to say, you know, you didn't like me as a Jew, we'll try this on for size. 
You know, it was always there was always that you know two-ness of you know um, of challenging and at the same time seeking um, to to blend in as she liked to put it more than once. Well, you know the the whole kind of identity slippage that goes on in her life, that really dramatic moment when she, as a, you know, as a kid, mm -hmm. impersonates a Nazi to rescue her parents. Yeah. And the way in, in the passage that you read to us, where she says, you have to believe that's who you are. Yeah. And she's not saying, I impersonated a Nazi. Mm -hmm. She said, I walked in there as a Nazi. Yeah. And rescued my parents, and because I believed it, they believed it, and they handed over my parents. And she doesn't talk about her transition as impersonating anything. You know, she is a woman and she embraced that identity. But the part I had trouble with throughout the whole book is this notion that you can continually choose. And in the context of where you are, you know, you're the mountaineer, you're the suburban father, you're, uh, you're the, the Jew who manages to survive. Mm -hmm. and, and then you're a trans woman without trying to pass. And she tried to pass as a Jew, but she's saying, no, I wasn't trying to pass. I embraced being a Nazi at that moment. <clears throat> to get out. And, you know, if, again, I, I keep thinking about how this story, as dramatic and unusual and unique as it is, I mean, there are lots of interesting stories. Your father's story is a <laughs> pretty dramatic one. That it, it also, you know, you, in the book you talk about nations as having to come to terms with new identities after World War II. And you know, people in those nations having to identify with new kinds of national citizenship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just, you know, you want to talk about that a little bit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, Hungary is just, you know, a model <laughs> or an anti-model. Um, uh, and, you know, has been an example that many Eastern European countries are, you know, have, have followed, Poland most notably. Um, and, you know, I mean, I mean, what was unnerving to me was that, you know, here I was going to Hungary to witness my father's identity search, and then suddenly, you know, here's this massive macro metaphor of it in my, um, in my father's um, homeland, um, I, and in that case, it was an example of identity quest gone, you know, horribly wrong. Um, and uh, you know, so so I'm there thinking, well, at least I can go back to the U.S. You know, this was a and and weirdly, there are all these connections with Hungary. Um, uh, Trump even had, you know, um, Sebastian, that Sebastian Gorka. I'm sorry? I said build that wall. <laughs> build that wall. He also had, but he had, he was a big, not only was Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, a big fan of Orban, of uh, Trump's, but vice versa. Uh, and uh, Newt Gingrich went over to Hungary to check out the wall and um, was tweeting about how wonderful it was. So, um, you know, I mean, this is this is what we're living with right now. And in a funny way, my what I thought was going to be a very personal story wound up being kind of a, a window to this huge worldwide battlefield of identity that we're seeing. Whether it's you know, the trumpets of the anti-immigrant hysteria. Um, you know, the most recent election in Italy, um, you know, Brexit, ISIS, and there's just a generous, you know, generation identitaire and the all right. Um, there, these are all um, questions.
request for uh, to identify, I mean, it's the dark side of identity, of, of identifying by uh, demonizing another. Uh, that you talk about in, in Fortress of America, like looking for, all, identify all the wrong enemies. You know, I have a problem, let me find all the people who can cause it. And that seems to be where we're stuck. <laughs> in, in your father's case, you know, it's it's so complicated because he never he never re rejected as a man when he was a man his identity as a Jew, and he then a man in the U.S. voted for Richard Nixon, a notorious anti-Semite, and so you know it, this kind of it, I'm not sure if it's a confusion or not. Well, I think you know one thing is. I'm here, and this is a grotesque generalization, um, but there's a, there's a strain of sort of Hungarianism that is pretty right wing, and it has a lot to do, well, I mean, it got reinforced with the years of, of communism. I mean, my father told me once, um, I had, that, that for years after coming to the US, my father said that she had this dream, this terrible nightmare that she was, that she, that she could um, and imprisoned in Qatar's Hungary, and Qatar was the, um, uh, prime minister, one of the prime ministers of Hungary under communism. But that's your nightmare? You never even lived under communism. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I don't even remember where I was going with this, but just the, um, remind me of your, oh, about why, why it was, you know, the other thing is about when my father was, uh, uh, you know, the all-American man in, in the U.S., um, that was a time where I, there wasn't a lot of embracing of Jewish identity. I mean, we, uh, my father made a point of having the most Christmas lights on our house and making sure that we sent out Christmas cards. And my father was very intent on blending in. So he was assimilating, you know, all along in many, in many ways. And yet, at the end of his life, when you reconnect with him, he, he kind of insists that this is who he was all along, and he was impersonating a man. Was he unhappy with the way you worked the pronouns in your book, where you referred to your father as he, up until the point of the transition? No. You know, well, I mean, also, if you remember in Hungary, there are, oddly, because it's a very gender, you know, traditional, culture, but there are no gendered pronouns. Oh. So yeah. you can always tell a Hungarian who's struggling with English because they'll they'll say, you know, I mean my father used to do this all the time, like, tell your mother he's late for the <laughs> grocery <laughs> store. Um, so no, that wasn't that wasn't that an, was issue. an issue. Yeah. yeah. Well um, I wanna open it up but I just want to end my little piece of this before we open it up to on, on the personal, um, which is that the, the book ends so powerfully and so poignantly and so emotionally resonant. Um, and, and in the end, you know, you bring the story back to your relationship to her. And, um, and, and that, was, that was very beautiful. I just want to say that. And, you know, it's not a question. I just want to say that. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's... I, uh, I, I, uh, this isn't really a question, per se, but um, I, uh, I wanted to offer my reaction. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was fascinating. Uh, and how I read into it was on the part of your father her having uh, a sense of Samuel ties as the absolute yes. in her life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, to get back to uh, the point about how she masqueraded as a Nazi to 
save her family and uh, uh, being repelled by Nazism, uh, I, there, there can really be no way for me to imagine it, uh, but uh, being repelled, but becoming a Nazi to to save um, to save her family, and then now now at the other side of your father's life. Uh, I, I just keep coming back to uh, the right wing politics that um, that your your father uh, adhered to uh, for for a what um, for a, a lifetime it, and I I can only read into it as uh, your father becoming uh, you could say masquerading but. Uh, becoming a woman to uh, to uh, be a hero to uh, his daughter, to her daughter, uh, out of uh, um, so uh, and maybe maybe still uh, hating the uh, the. Um, the the disguise of of, of uh, coming a woman and and yet Samuel uh, <coughs> love being being the, the guiding force and uh, it's, it's one of that's very astute perceptive I mean I think there a lot of this revolved around family and and I mean and the awful paradox here because. Here's my father who cut herself off first from her, you know, from the family she was born into, and then cut herself off from the family she had created, and yet she was trying to find her way back. And a lot of what she, um, a lot of what the, uh, when my father would talk about rescuing my grandparents, this would always culminate with I brought the family together, um, and often followed by. You know, uh, the accusation that I failed on that score because my you know, my mother had had enough of my father finally divorced my father and my father felt I should have kept the family together like she kept the family together when she was a teenager. So everything sort of goes back to the, the family not. Um, and, and the first passage that you read about, you know, his as as a as a father, his identity as the father of the family that he left. Yeah. And then as a woman, she wanted grandchildren yeah. to sustain the family and was yeah. and was upset with you for not fulfilling her dreams for the family that yeah. as a woman she turned away from. Human beings are really complicated <laughs> critters. <laughs> Especially father, she, did. she was a particularly <laughs> complicated person, most challenging journalistic assignment. <laughs> um, so, um, so how does she feel now about the political situation? My father died two oh. years ago. Yeah, but <laughs> she voted for Fidesz. Um, you know, at the time. Um, she made the distinction. Well, I wouldn't. I I wouldn't vote for Jovic because Jovic is an openly anti-Semitic party. Ironically, and since um, her death, Fidesz has moved even farther to the right to the point where Jovic has tried to kind of cleanse its past <laughs> and or, 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 or its image. Um, and just recently, um, there was a big uh, regional election where uh, Jovic, along with the other uh, left of center of parties, cleaned up and gave, you know, delivered a, a stunning defeat to Fidesz. There's, a, there's supposed to be a national election, uh, you know, coming up. So there's, uh, uh, this is uh, in, in April. Um, so this, and Fidesz has recently been like giving out, basically buying votes by, um, giving people uh, 
uh, heating credits, and they're sending out like, gifts for Easter, which conveniently is like right before the election. Um, so, uh, so it may be, it's still, a fetus is still ahead in the polls. Um, and like here, most people don't vote. So they may still, you know, even though there's a lot of um, uh, rising uh, resentment and uh, second thoughts about fetus in, in the country, it's not clear that they're going to be defeated. Um, I mean, I guess you, you obviously saw the, um, the danger of going to the march. Yeah. And yeah. so she could sense how things, in a sense, that she had supported were yeah. leading in a direction where, you know, the, the choice to be a trans woman who doesn't want to pass mm -hmm. becomes increasingly dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, she, but I guess she made a distinction between that and a fetus start, I mean, fetus, the fetus party started out actually as relatively liberal or moderate and way back when in the early 90s and then it shifted and before my father died it was more like a center-right party so I think that's how she rationalized it. I think the other key to my father's psychology is that what she really yearned for was the return of the, the this, what was known as the golden age of Hungarian Jewry in the um, sort of second half of the 19th century, um, and that more or less pertained, you know, prevailed until World War One. You know, my father was born in the tw in the 20s, and but you know, was surrounded by growing up by family members who who recalled this sort of wonderful period where it seemed that Jews would be accepted. So a lot of my father, my father also, I think, had this dream of going back to that era and wanting like a strong figure the way that, you know, um, uh, you know the Austro, you know, wanted the, emperor, the, the good emperor back. And so I think that was part of the kind of fantasy with, with some of these right-wing parties. You know, Victor Orban was um, not exactly a, might have been an emperor, but it's not a good one, so. Um, in the book, you talk about how you were sort of inspired by Nellie Bly as this idea of, oh. a, <laughs> of a, like, dashing reporter that then mm -hmm. becomes part of the narrator's identity, and I was just curious about um, inspirations from other, like, female reporters and female journalists in your career as a journalist. Uh, well. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's funny you mention that because I, I teach this class at Smith about um, uh, women journalists, and so we, we spend some time on Nellie Bly, just you know, talking about her, who was quite the suffragist. People just remember her as the one who went around the world in not in eighty days, and like maybe seventy-two days, beating the fictional record of Jules Verne. Um, but uh, yeah, I have a whole list of others. Um, uh, you know, and interestingly, they tend to be women marginalized in one way or another. I mean, um, you know, the journalism of Ida B. Wells, um, uh, Martha Shad Carey, who was uh, the first the first female publisher in. Canada, I believe, and also the first black um, female publisher and editor in North America, um, who was another rebel rouser. I mean, there are there are many who um, worship at the shrine. And so yeah, and when I was a kid, I mean, instead of reading those books, you know, you're supposed to read those young adult books, or at least in my era, <laughs> it really dates me. You know, someone you who. Know, Jane Kensington, Candy Striper, <laughs> there was this whole series of registered nurse. I was always like, reading the ones on the journalists. So. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, we should, shouldn't forget that Hungary was a uh, part of the Nazi, of the, uh, Nazi bloc. Yeah, absolutely, the, uh, yeah. The Axis bloc. Yeah, they were the, one of the first to sign up. But this fascinating, intriguing story about your father 
makes me gives me the impression that these, at least these later choices of identity, weren't really necessarily fundamental expressions of something fundamental. Uh, they're layers, and I think, and it makes me wish that um, that what we had is a 